Good morning. A very warm welcome to Discovery Bay International School and our early years webinar. My name is Sheila Stamp. Excuse the uh, bell that's going over the top of our um, webinar at the moment. It's our school bell. I'm the Director of IT and Communications at DBIS. With me today are my colleagues, Hannah Cole, our Head of Early Years, and Helen Harries, our Admissions Manager. With the current COVID situation, it has been difficult to give parents the opportunity to visit our school. And so the aim of this webinar is to give you some insight into our early years and to ask any questions you might have. We will start with a short video of our early years campus, and then we will have a question and answer session with Helen and Hannah. If you could type any questions you have into the video box, into the chat box, we'll answer them immediately after the video. Hannah, before we start the video, would you like to say a few words? I'd love to. A um, very warm welcome to you this morning. It's a real pleasure to be able to share with you our early years setting. Um, I'm a head of early years. I've worked at the school for 13 years um, in various different capacities um, across both the primary and the early years. And my other role that I have is, of course, a mother. So I understand the anxieties, the excitement you all have in terms of choosing the right school for your child. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you this morning. And I really hope that you enjoy learning more about our school. A very warm welcome to our DBIS Early Years, where we value play as a powerful tool to support children's learning and development. Our approach is underpinned by the philosophy and values of Reggio Emilia, which believes that all children are equipped with extraordinary potentials for learning. Our job as practitioners is to facilitate opportunities for learning, where the children can develop skills, explore concepts through their own interests, and attribute sense and meaning to the world around them. When children are engaged, they will retain and absorb more of their learning, and there is no better way to engage children than through their play. Our settings are purposefully neutral to create a calm, familiar environment which allows the children to make links to their home, creating a sense of safety and familiarity. It is the children's learning which brings the colour to the environment. We recognise the value our surrounding environment and community brings to the children's learning. Therefore, establishing community links and positive relationships is a key part of our ethos. We view parents as the child's first teacher. Therefore, positive relationships with parents who take an active role in their child's development are seen as a very important part of the child's school experience. We value experiential learning opportunities such as Forest School, which is on-site, and Beach School off-site, which promote opportunities to explore and engage with the natural environment. In addition, children are provided with opportunities to engage through woodwork, which supports the development of a whole host of problem-solving, creative and mathematical skills, as well as personal, social and emotional development, which was one of the three prime areas of learning in the Early Years Foundation Stage curriculum. DBIS Early Years offers children a personalised learning experience where their well-being is prioritised. We know that happiness and engagement leads to achievement and success and look forward each day to going on wonderful adventures with the children. We hope you found the video informative and useful. Um, there aren't any questions up on our chat as yet, but we do get asked a number of things regularly on the school tours. Hannah, um, for example, would you like to elaborate on what experiential learning opportunities there are at DBIS? 
Yes, of course. Um, one of the things I just wanted to point out as well um, is that our early years phase runs from nursery right through to year two at DBIS. And the campus that you have just seen in the video is our early years campus, which accommodates our children in nursery and reception. Um, our year one and two children, what we call our early years one and two children, they're located at the main campus and you will see similarities in the environments that the children learn in, um, but you will also see progression and differences. So I just wanted to point out for any parents that we have today of children that are in year one or two, um, the campus that you have seen is not necessarily the campus that your child would learn on, but it is very similar to the opportunities that they would get. Um, and with that, it's really exciting to talk to you about the forest school and beach school and woodwork opportunities and we call these our experiential learning opportunities um, because the children learn outside of the classroom and they develop a range of skills um, in the early years we recognize that children need skills to be able to apply to their learning to be able to be inquirers to be able to solve problems and what better way to do that than through experience so the children have regular opportunities um, to be able to visit our forest um, they go and explore and the focus with the um, forest and with all of the experiential learning opportunities is that children are guided by their interests. So we want the children to find things that they're interested in. We want the children to be able to um, learn with their friends, to co cooperate, to collaborate. Um, when they go to the forest, there is a forest located at the early years campus and we have a forest located at the main campus as well. Um, we have Denzel the dragon, who is a who offers a, a hook for the children, um, often a challenge that the children may or may not want to participate in. So it might be something like to make a, a representation of themselves using the different materials that they can find in the forest. And that then might inspire interest in other areas. And it's much the same. Um, sort of experience if the children were going to the beach. So much the same philosophy. They, they would go to the beach with their teachers and the adults that they learn with. They would have a hook to get them excited about what they're learning. And then they would be encouraged to explore and interact. And communication and language is a real important part of our curriculum. So the children actually having that opportunity to interact freely with their friends and interact freely with the adults that they learn with too is really, really important. And finally, we have woodwork or what we've now rebranded as Carpenter's Cabin. So the children have an opportunity each week um, as part of their provision to be able to go and explore woodwork. And again, this is an amazing opportunity to develop a whole host of skills um, involving problem solving, mathematical skills. Um, the children may make things that they then want to take back into their environments, which may host um, may inspire storytelling opportunities. The, the opportunities are endless and we very much focus on where the children take their learning so that we can join them in their play and then start to develop their skills as well with them. So experiential learning is a really, really important part of our early years um, experience with children. Thank you. We have seen, we're getting some questions in now. Um, the second question is actually directly to do with Beach and forest schooling and the question is will they be able to do this during the COVID times? That's a really really good question um, at the moment um, we're not able to take the children off site particularly when the beaches were closed so usually the children would do forest school they'd start off doing forest school in nursery and then our children would start beach school in reception and then when they come up to the main campus they have a combination of either forest school or beach school but usually we focus on the forest because it's a different and new setting for the children um, at the moment during um, the current restrictions that we're operating under we're not taking the children off site into the community to avoid them mixing as much as possible um, but we are keeping the children in their class bubbles and that means that we are able to offer them the forest school learning experience so as I was on my way up to this campus this morning um, I left our safari children um, aptly named um, in the forest school and they were doing exactly that they were exploring with each other and they had their hook they were off um, dragging their sticks around finding the leaves looking at the different things that they were finding so so, so at the moment, we are able to continue with our on-site experiential learning opportunities. Um, the first question that we actually had came in um, was, can you tell us more about the curriculum, please? Yes, of course. So we, um, our early, uh, early years children in terms of nursery and reception follow the early years foundation stage curriculum. Um, and our children, as they move into years one and two, um, the objectives that they learn, the expectations that they need to achieve are according to the national curriculum of England um, and the expectations for the end of key stage one, which is year two, um, are, are drawn from that curriculum. 
Um, now that's that's the curriculum and what the children learn, but the way that we learn is very much, um, it's a very important part of the experience we have at the early years because our children, our approach to learning very much is through experience and through play. Um, and we recognize, as you would have seen from the video, that we know that children learn best when they're engaged and what better way to do that than joining them through their play. So we have lots of opportunities for the children to access their environment and we join the children with knowing what we need to support them with in their learning and through play. So the early years foundation stage is the curriculum. The key stage one curriculum of England is the curriculum that we follow in terms of knowing what the children need to learn at different points. But the way that we do that is joining the children through play and recognizing the environment is a very important part of that. So ensuring that the learning environment is somewhere where the children can access their learning and develop even in the absence of a teacher. Right, we have another question. Oops. Sorry. We have another question. Is all teaching in English or is there any exposure to Mandarin? So the, the medium that we teach in is English, but we have specialist subjects, which is, uh, Mandarin is a specialist subject. So the children in nursery and reception, they have a Mandarin session twice a week. And the children then come up to EY1 and 2 and they have a lesson four times a week. Um, we have had to adapt slightly at the moment with the current restrictions because the children are in school for less time. So they do have some Mandarin face to face learning and then they have some Mandarin that takes place online. Um, but under normal circumstances, which we certainly hope that we're moving towards much more now, um, the children would have two uh, lessons of Mandarin in nursery and reception each week. And then they would come up to EY1 and 2 and have four sessions of half an hour. Um, we do recognise that we have Mandarin native speakers that join our school at every point um, throughout the school. So we do have Mandarin native speaking groups to support those children as well. We have another question. Are there ways for parents to contribute to projects? We would love to be part of all of this as it looks such great fun. Absolutely. Um, we recognise parents as your child's first teacher because you know your children best and you have been learning with your child since the day that they were born. So relationships with parents are really, really important to us at the early years. Um, again, the current restrictions do not allow us to have lots of people in and out of the school, um, but under normal circumstances, we absolutely love having parents involved. We love having parents involved with the visits to the beach. We love having parents involved with um, opportunities that take place in the classrooms. We love having parents involved in trips and visits that usually happen. So there are very much um, lots of opportunities and we encourage that for you as parents to become involved because we want to work in partnership with you to support your child's learning. I just um, I picked up as well, Sheila, um, a question about so no structured lessons. Um, the children do uh, learn maths and they do learn English and they do learn those through lessons. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, and certainly from, from year one and year two, we will pop up provision in the classroom to be able to support that. So it may be that the children have a direct teaching and play can be um, a very scary word for parents. It can be a very scary word for teachers at times because play implies that children are not learning anything. But actually, um, play is where the children are learning most. So we will pop up provision within the environment that supports the children in making all sorts of connections. Um, the children will have opportunities throughout the day where the teacher may well have a group of children to be able to teach knowledge, to be able to teach skills that they will then take with them to apply within the environment. So um, if, for example, we were talk teaching them about addition, there would be opportunities where the teachers would be talk talking to the children and actually explicitly teaching them particular skills. Um, and there would be times where teachers would be joining the children in their play. Um, they might be, uh, for example, in the home corner and having a wonderful time with their friends in role play. And the teacher might join them in their play and start talking to them about, um, OK, so we're in the home corner and we've decided that we've made this area into a restaurant. And how about we start making a menu? How about we start thinking about the different things that people are going to eat? So um, lessons do take place and, and we have opportunities for specific subjects of learning, um, but the environment is very much the third teacher within our school and um, so the environment promotes learning in all aspects of learning throughout the day. We've got a question for you Helen, um, could you give some more details on the application process, waiting lists, acceptance, numbers of places etc? Of course, of course. Um, the application is uh, an online uh, application where you fill in all your child's details um, once we receive the application and the application fee, your child then gets added to our wait list. Um, the wait list then we go through on a priority basis on um, date or whether you have siblings in the school. 
that would give you a, a higher placement on the wait list if you have um, another child at DBIS. Um, and from there, when your name comes to the top of the wait list, we then would invite you for an interview. Um, and we go then on to admissions from there. Um, in terms of new nursery, so when your child is three is the age you're um, able to enter our nursery school. There we take applications throughout the year and um, we, we take, normally we take the first hundred on the wait list for new nursery positions. And we would then look at offering places in the December before the August start date. We've got another question following up on curriculum. Uh, reading, writing, maths, do you use Jolly Phonics, RWI? Is there a math scheme? Yes, yes. so in, in terms of our phonics, again, um, there are opportunities. We talk about what is play and what is not play. And teaching children phonics is definitely not play. It's something that the children need to learn, and, but we hope that the skills that they learn through their phonics learning will then be applied um, in a meaningful way, in a meaningful way for, to the children. So for example, the example I was using just now about writing menus, writing different things that the children can apply that learning in is really, really important and an example of that. But we use RWI, which is Read, Write, Think. So the children start learning phonics right from nursery. They start learning pre-phonics skills in nursery, such as rhyme. Um, and then when they get into reception, we start explicitly teaching the phonics program. And that follows the children right through to year two. Um, all of the adults in our setting that work with the children have been trained in delivering the RWI program. Um, we have used RWI in the school for the last 14 years. And for our school, we don't we, we haven't found a better system. We haven't found a better scheme for teaching phonics. Um, we know that the success rate is very high. Um, and it's the prescriptive nature of the program that we believe is something that supports the children very much. So the children are taught um, that combination of the letters make sounds and that it's not always um, the initial sound. So they, they learn um, a series of sounds which starts with the letters of the alphabet but then it goes through to um, set two sounds and set three sounds so the children learn for example that IGH makes the sound I. Um, so we teach that to the children from reception right through to year two and it's taught in very small groups according to where your child is at. So the children undergo um, regular work with their teachers and regular work with the person that will oversee RWI um, to understand where the children's learning is at. And then they are put into a group according to where they need to start from and where they need to make progress. It's a very rigorous program. It's a daily program. It's taught in the same way with the same adults, um, but very, very successful. So Read, Write, Inc. And if you wanted to search online, Read, Write, Inc. has a fantastic website, which involves parent resources as well. Um, that you can access and that you can understand a little bit more if you want to find out more about the Read Writing programme. Um, for maths, when the children move into key stage one, we, we draw upon the White Rose resources and schemes of work, which are again from the, the English national curriculum um, or from England, I should say. Um, and then um, the children will you know, access various resources, but we don't stick to a particular scheme. We're very much about our children and our school and our setting. Um, so we will tailor the learning to meet the children that we have. So we don't deliver a scheme. We don't have a handbook of working through day to day. This is what we teach next. We're very much guided where the children are at um, and we will adapt the environment to suit the needs of the children. Uh, we have another waitlist question. Is the waitlist per family or per child? I ask as I have triplets. Gosh, that's a handful. In that case, um, for triplets, then obviously it would be um, per family. It would be all, all three. We look for admitting all three at the same time. If you have children in other year groups, so if you have a child in nursery and a child in reception, it is per child. However, when you do have um, a child and we offer them an interview, that automatically puts your other child um, up to the top of the waiting list because you would get sibling priority for your other child. That makes sense. <laughs> We've got another question. Um, looks like you've got STEM learning covered amazingly well. May we know about music, art and drama? Absolutely. Um, so we have specialist subjects that are taught um, right from nursery. So we have specialist teachers that will get to know your children as well as they move throughout the school. Um, our specialist subjects are in physical education, music, 
um, Mandarin and learning technologies. Now, we, we don't want those subjects ever to be standalone subjects that the children just go to and the learning is very much captured within that lesson and then never applied elsewhere. And learning technologies is a fantastic example of that. So at the moment with our nursery and reception children, they don't actually go anywhere to do learning technologies. The learning is very much brought to them by our ICT or our learning technologies teacher, um, who then works alongside and coaches our teachers to be able to upskill our teachers even to be able to make sure that the technology is delivered as a part of the learning within um, that takes place within the classroom. Um, and that's a philosophy that's carried right through the school. Um, in terms of music, the children do have weekly opportunities with our music teacher, and that happens all the way through up until year six in primary school. Um, Mandarin, I've spoken about already. Art and drama are not taught as standalone subjects in terms of the specialist teachers, but they will happen within the classroom. Um, and that happens as part of the holistic curriculum that we offer. We have another question. How does the school keep the parents informed about the developmental progress of the children? Are there any regular catch up sessions or is it on an ads needs basis? So um, another really good question. We do have formal points when we will contact you and be in touch with you as parents about your children's learning. But like I said, um, positive relationships with parents are something that really underpin our phase. So we very much encourage an open door policy and that if you're ever concerned about an aspect of your child's development or learning, um, that you contact your child's teacher so that we can make sure that we are having those conversations with you in the moment rather than waiting to any formal re um, reporting or parent um, evening procedures. Um, that being said, we do have those formal times when we report to parents. Um, for nursery children, we do a formal report at the end of the school year, and that's the same for reception as well. And then we have regular parent meetings throughout the year, um, three times a year, once when your child comes into school so that we can learn about your child, um, once at the end of term two, and then in, uh, sorry, end of term one, and then in term two as well, um, so that we can update you on the progress that your child is making. In key stage one, so in EY1 and EY2, we will send you home a report, which is a commentary report. It's a commentary based on what your child is, is um, progressing in and their targets going forward for the next term. Um, and they receive that report at the end of term one. So that will be November or December time. And then they have their end of year report as well. Um, and those reports are always followed up with a formal parent meeting so that we have the opportunity to be able to discuss things with you. Um, and likewise, when we have moments to celebrate, of which there are many, um, we always make sure that we're in touch with parents so that you're knowing those points of success that your children are achieving. We have another question. Uh, my children will be reception age. How many hours is the school? So normally um, our school day for nursery and for reception children is 8.55 starting and the ch children go home at 2.40. Um, for our children in EY1 and EY2, the school day starts at 8.25 and it finishes at 3.10. Sorry, what was the other part of the question? Um, how many, uh, my children will be reception age, how many hours? Okay, so 8.55 until 2.40 under normal circumstances. At the moment, we have our children and we've, we've just changed our, our um, school day again based on the, the new restrictions that we're able to operate under. So we're actually having our nursery and reception children starting at 8.30 and they leave school at 12.30. So they're in for four hours. And for our nursery children, that actually means that in terms of the contact learning time, they're getting the majority of their school day because they would usually have um, half an hour to eat their lunch, they would have half an hour to go outside and play, and then we're, we're required in nursery by the government to have a half hour rest time in the afternoon, um, so they would come into um, from playtime, we would roll out some yoga mats and they have a calm half an hour time um, where they are just taking their time to have a rest and then be ready for the afternoon's learning. Another question for you, Helen. Uh, you mentioned an interview as part of the admissions process. For nursery age, what format does this interview take? Okay, um, so obviously when the children are barely three years old, um, it's not a formal interview as such. It's more of an opportunity for us to meet you and your child and just to see um, how what they like, what they dislike, and just um, to get to know you before you come to school. Um, we sometimes ask the child to bring a toy or a favourite um, item for them to talk about, excuse me, um, and that then just makes the, um, the interaction with us a little easier. Another question, do you have an online profile for the children parents can access? Yes, absolutely. We, we use the platform Seesaw. 
So Seesaw is a platform where the children, um, we've used it slightly differently during these COVID times because we've needed to be much more online and much more interactive at home and at school. Um, but usually you would have a family app for Seesaw, which allows you to be able to see your child's learning. And it's a window into the classroom. And this is where we will um, show opportunities, especially when the learning is so active to show you what your children is up or your child is up to. Um, they can also, if they go through the school, because Seesaw follows them through into primary, they may well be uploading their own learning. Um, and it's used as an online portfolio for the children to be able to share their learning with you. And you can also have other family members. We have grandparents, we have aunts, uncles that are able to see uh, or access Seesaw. It, and you would have the um, permissions to be able to do that um, or the control over that. Um, but it's a wonderful audience for the children to know that whatever they put on Seesaw sometimes is not only seen by their parents, but it's also seen by people, grandparents overseas, for example. So Seesaw is our online learning platform. Um, and again, if you look at Seesaw online, then you'll be able to find out a little bit more information as to regards to that platform. We've got another question. How many students in a class? So in the nursery and reception, we have 20 students in a class. And then in EY1 and 2, we have 25, or on occasions, we might have 26 children in a class. Um, that may differ depending, sometimes we know that children are leaving and so we have sometimes children um, joining and there's a little bit of an overlap, but generally it's 20 children to a class and then 25 or 26 children in EY1 or 2. Um, we have adults in the classroom um, from nursery through to EY2, so we have a teacher and an education assistant that is working with the children, so they will know two adults really, really well, um, along with all of the other adults in our setting that work with the children as well on a specialist basis. Another question. Hi, thanks for doing this. For year one kids, are there any initiatives to encourage learning from kids in higher years? What sort of interaction, if any, is there between kids of different years? So um, this is something, again, that, that we uh, recognise that we are an early years phase, but we are part of one school. Um, there are lots of opportunities for the children to interact. Again, I must stress that this is under normal circumstances, because at the moment we can't have lots of mixing of children. Um, but we have student councils, so we have an early year student council, so the children from nursery through to EY2 meet together, and then the children in the primary council meet together, and then they often meet as a combined group. Um, we have buddies, so the children have buddies that they get to know when they're in the early years, so that when they come and join us in EY1 on the main campus, that they have some familiar older faces from the children. And um, the children also have lots of opportunities to interact with the older students, whether that be on projects, whether that be um, within the playground, they will see their buddies on the playground. Um, so lots of opportunities throughout the year for them to learn from their older, older colleagues or their older peers. Um, there is another question about the number of students. Sorry. There are another question about the number of students and how many adults, but I think you've already covered that. Um, oh, but how many adults support the 25 plus kids in one class? That's an early as one and two, I would assume. So EY one and two, it will be the same. So it's one adult and one education assistant that work with the children full time. Um, and then there will be other adults that work with the children throughout the day. But your child will have a teacher and an education assistant if they're in EY one and two. How many reception classes are there? Is there a one form entry or two form entry? Um, under again, normal circumstances, we are usually a five form entry. So we usually have 100 children per year group. Now, at the moment, we um, we are operating four classes. So we have 80 children. Um, and our intention at the moment is to operate either four or five classes for reception next year. So when we are at capacity, um, we are operating five on a five form entry. And then when the children move up to the main campus into EY1, they then go into four form entry. So they then go from five classes into four classes of 25. I think we've run out of questions, unless anybody else has got anything else they would like to ask. If not, um, thank you very much for your time today. We hope it was a useful session, and we very much hope that we'll be able to meet you again soon. Um, we've got more information on the website, uh, so if you go to it, it's dbis.edu.hk, and you'll be able to contact us through that. And, um, oh, we've got another question. Just one second, I'll move on to We live in South Lantau. How do the earliest children cope with the bus journey? So the children at the moment, our bus or our external bus service is operating from Tung Chung. 
Um, so the children that come in from outside of Discovery Bay they, and they use the school bus service, that will be from Tung Chung. Um, we have a number of children actually from nursery and reception that come on our bus and they are accompanied onto the bus. We have a bus mother and our school nurse actually collect, uh, takes the children as well on that school bus. And then they come off the bus with the adults, collecting them and bringing them straight into school. And they cope amazingly well. Um, I welcomed them in this morning and they, they all come in and they're, they're lying, they know where they're going. Um, they go to a classroom to be looked after before the start of the school day under normal circumstances because the children would arrive slightly earlier than the rest of the children um, but at the moment they're actually arriving at the same time as the other children so they come off the bus and then they go straight into class and they're accompanied by an adult. Um, we actually do have a number of children that do come from South Lantau. We don't actually have a bus laid on there at the moment, but we're now getting to a critical number where we might be able to offer a bus journey from um, Moiwo um, through to um, the roundabout and up over the hill. But that isn't uh, confirmed as yet. But um, I mean, if you were interested in joining the school, um, it would be something that we could probably discuss and explore further. Um, I'll just got, answer the question, Sheila, about the, um, the splitting of the, if for any parents that have triplets or twins or, or any multiples of children. Um, in, in terms of whether the children would be placed in a class together or whether they would be placed in a class, class separately, that would be a conversation that we would have with you um, and, and it would be dealt with on a case by case basis. Um, depending on our numbers, it may not be possible for two children or three children to be placed together um, or it may well be possible. So that would be something that we would um, talk to you about as parents because our intention of that conversation is to find out what is best for your children. Um, so we would not, we don't have a school policy on particularly in our early years of splitting siblings and we don't have a policy of keeping them together. What we do have a policy on is making sure that we act in the best interests of the children. Um, so that would be a conversation that we would have with you on a case by case basis if you had twins or triplets or any other combinations of children. I'm going back to one slightly earlier question. Um, uh, how many classes of students in each grade of middle school and high school? I can um, answer that separately. We're going to have two additional webinars for the primary school and the secondary school coming up. And I can probably answer um, th those questions will be answered in those sessions. Um, but I can also tell you, are they all IB classes? We follow the English national curriculum through to GCSEs and um, A-levels. Um, and our children come out with a qualification at 16 and 18. And uh, we're very lucky that uh, the majority of our students managed to go to the first uh, the university of their first choice. So academically, we have consistency right through from the early years, right through to the sixth form. But there'll be more details in the primary and uh, secondary sessions. So we'd recommend that you join that. Otherwise, send us a separate email and we'll, we'll be happy to answer those questions in another format. Just, there's a couple of questions that have popped up about um, the campus as well. Um, we do have a significant amount of outdoor space for the children. Um, and the forest school aspect of, um, encourages nature play. Um, so the children will access the forest during their forest school time. Um, we, as I say, we, we have a significant amount of outdoor space, both on our main campus sites and on our um, early years campus site for the children to explore. Um, and it's really important for me to point out that those environments are very carefully planned. So those environments aren't just there for the children. Um, they've been planned and set up in a way that we know will support with the development of their skills. So when the children are outside, we, we tend to try and not call it playtime because the children are always learning. We often refer to it as outdoor learning time because the children are accessing the provision in a way that's been set up for them purposefully to be able to continue learning. Um, and yes, we do have an emphasis on sustainability. We have clubs for the children, edu um, extracurricular activities that the children can specifically join if they have an interest in sustainability. Um, but we also, it's something that we talk about a lot of the time, it's on our learner profile about being a responsible citizen. Um, so we talk to the children a lot about sustainability. Um, the work to play ratio, uh, there's a question of what is the work to play ratio? Really interesting pro, uh, question because the answer to that question is the children are always working and they are always playing, but this, the two are inter, uh, interlinked. Um, the children are playing and the children are learning. So we don't have um, 
you know, stopping the children and saying, right now, now you're not going to play. The children will be playing all of the time unless they're in a specific um, phonics session, for example. Um, and the learning will be brought to the children through their play, um, particularly in nursery and reception. So um, the children will come in and they'll be able to develop a range of skills. They will have times when they come to the car um, carpet as a group and they will have times when they are learning together in a specific group. And they'll have times when they may be learning by themselves, but we don't have a play to work ratio because the children are playing and therefore they're always learning and we plan our environments and the way that we play with the children in a very specific way so that their play is not low level it's purposefully planned play um qualifications of teachers yes, yes, yes. our teachers need to um have teaching qualifications um so as the question is put that would be pgc level or a ba in education primary educational early years or early childhood um, so it would be university level qualifications and all of our teachers have to be um, have their qualifications assessed by the Hong Kong Qualifications Bureau and to be um, cleared in terms of being able to teach in Hong Kong, that is a requirement. So yes, all of our teachers have teaching degrees and are qualified teachers. We've also got a question about differentiation in, in the lessons. So again, we, we recognise the children as individuals. Um, so the differentiation is brought to the children in terms of very much where they're at. We know where your child needs to make progress. And so therefore we will plan for that to happen. Um, so differentiation is considered within the planning and it's considered when we're working with your children in terms of extending them and supporting them. Are your teachers from around the world? And a question about inclusion. Yes, yes, our teachers are from around the world. We um, generally advertise in the Times Education as a, a supplement. So our teachers come from a range of different countries. Um, we do have a number, I would say the, um, well, I say the majority, we do have a, a higher number of teachers from the UK than we do any other nationality, but we have teachers from New Zealand, from Canada, um, from Australia. So we have quite an eclectic mix of teachers um, within our school. Um, inclusion. There's a question about inclusion. I'm not sure if that means do we have an inclusion department? Um, we do have an inclusion department because we are an inclusive school. Um, so if your child has any additional needs and it requires any specific support, um, again, very much on a case by case basis in terms of what your child's needs are and how we can best support those. But we have a whole department of inclusion teachers and education assistants that work with the children that need that additional support. Another question moving forward, what would be your plan if the schools were to shut again due to COVID? Um, our plan would be to revert to our online learning programme. Um, we have actually seen massive success with our online learning programme and I say that wholeheartedly from nursery right through to year six in primary and then into our secondary as well. Um, do we think that online learning is the best way for children to learn? Absolutely not. We want them in school with us. But do we believe in the online learning program that we can offer our children? Absolutely. Um, what we found is that um, the children, you know, for, for our younger children, those relationships with their teachers and their relationships with their peers are really, really important. And the only way that we can facilitate that when we're closed um, by COVID restrictions is through an online environment. Um, but like when the children are learning in school, we recognise that they don't only learn in an online environment so when the school was closed previously um, we offered a range of activities and resources that were going home for the children depending on which year group they were in so that they had a mixture of um, opportunities that they could be doing at home that were offline and opportunities that they could be doing that were online as well and that was a mixture of live learning opportunities and that was a mixture of also um, recorded opportunities and the success of our program has very much been because we have involved our parents at every opportunity to try and get feedback as to what is working well um, now what we found of course is that things work well for different families and for different children and so the program that we developed was and continue to develop and will continue to develop if we are in a position of being closed again is very much trying to support all of the different requirements all of the different needs from families that have parents that are at home to support the children to working parents who do not have you know they are not at home to be able to support their children 
Um, so we do have in a, in a very sort of nutshell way of, of describing our online program or, or our home learning program is that there is a mixture of live learning, which is with the class and teacher, um, either in a whole class group or in a small group or sometimes on a one to one individual basis. Um, there will be recorded opportunities for the children to access and there will be resource packs that are sent home that have different prompts and um, and opportunities that you may like to set up at home with the resources that we provide so that you're able to do that as well. Um, so we had paints going home, we had um, uh, small parts, loose parts play going home so that you could set up those opportunities at home um, if you wanted to. And, and very much that communication between home and school was vitally important during school closure um, so that we could make sure that we could to make that as successful as possible for, for all of our individual families. Um, what we noticed just from a nursery point of view, because I know that there are always concerns, well, my three-year-old, how are they going to access online learning? Um, what we noticed actually was the children that um, started in the online format when they did come into school, um, we noticed that they had those relationships with their teachers and that they had those relationships with their peers, even though it was in an online environment for the first few weeks of term. When they came into school, their transition was really, really supported because they had had those opportunities. So um, we do have a mixture of online and offline opportunities for the children, but it's a program that we very much believe in um, and that is always open to adaption and evaluation so that we can make sure that it's the best that it possibly can be for our families. Thank you. I think uh, we've run out of questions now. So. Um, but further ado, we'll say goodbye and uh, please keep in touch. Drop us an email or go to the website if you need any more information. Oh, no, we've got another question. Do we have sports, music and programmes? We're, we're happy to stay here as long as you like. <laughs> um, yes, so we do have um, an extracurricular pro programme. Um, now, this evolves as the children get older because we recognise also that the children at a very young age coming to school in itself is exhausting. And so we don't have lots and lots of opportunities for the children, um, but they do progress as they move through the school. Um, so when the children are in nursery and reception, we have um, a few opportunities that take place either during um, very, very just before the start of the school day. Um, and as they move through into year one and two, there are opportunities like lunchtime sports activities and music activities. Um, they, we have a movement club, we have a dance club, um, we have a physical activity club in P stage one, and, and that will either take place before school or after school or, or sometimes at lunch times as well. Um, there are various music clubs as well. Um, as I said before, there's a sustainability club. And as the children move school, through the school, there's more and more opportunities in terms of sports and music available to them. Um, I'm trying to think, does that answer the question at all in terms of sport and oh, music wise? I just wanted to point out as well, we do have a peripatetic music program. So if your child um, wanted to learn an instrument, again, that's something that they can do, I believe, from year one, they can start learning the violin. And then from year two, they can also start learning other instruments as well. But that is an additional program um, that is with external peripatetic teachers that come in. So that would be something that is um, at a cost to families. Um, the education or the extracurricular activities that we offer in school are completely free of charge. We don't charge parents anything extra for any sporting music or extracurricular activities that take place. Um, so that is completely free of charge. But the peripatetic music program is something that is an additional extra if you wanted your child to participate in that. And it's also quiet. Yes, yes. Do you have a special needs department? So our special needs department is the inclusion department. So, so yes, we do. We have an inclusion department to cope with a uh, range of needs. When will you resume school tours? Um, currently, our school tours, as you are probably aware, are not operating um, due to the government restrictions. Um, our priority at the moment is the safety of our students at school. Um, so we are limiting the number of um, visitors, um, which is why we are doing these sessions. And hopefully these will help um, in terms of your um, choosing the school or knowing more about DBIS. Um, so I cannot give you a date of when we'll resume. Um, we're going to do it in line with um, the government easing restrictions in football. I'll just add, there's a question about our approach to behaviour management as well and whether this is something that our school is confident in. Um, and the short answer to that is absolutely yes. 
Um, our focus is on positive interactions and empowering children through choices and positive, positive interactions with each other. Um, so right from the start, and this is um, personal, social and emotional development is one of the three core areas of the children's learning when they come in at nursery or um, the early years foundation stage. Um, so we, we model to the children positive interactions, we model to the children positive language, and we try to empower the children through choices. So rather than telling the children, no, 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 don't, 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 which is a word that your children will have heard up until the age of three approximately, um, Gosh, there's, there's a statistic that is, is mind blowing in terms of the amount of times that your child will have heard the word no by the time they come to school. Um, but the underpinning point is that the word no becomes very meaningless if they hear it all the time. And um, so our approach is very much based on positive interactions with the children, um, teaching them to be able to resolve conflict with each other and empowering them with the skills. So jumping in and supporting them rather than jumping in and reprimanding or, or you know, um, solving the problem for the children. So our approach is very much positive with the children. We use positive language and focus on the things the children can do. Um, so for example, a very, very simple example would be that if we saw children running in an unsafe environment, it, our, our approach would not be stop, don't run. It would be, this is a walking area and we need to use our feet to walk to be safe. So we empower the children through um, positive language and that is something that is modeled to the children as well. Is music and drama part of the curriculum or is it just a extracurricular? Music is a standalone um, specialist subject that's taught and then drama is something that will come through the English curriculum. So the children will have lots of opportunity for drama, role play um, throughout their time in class. But music is a specialist subject. But again, music is something that the children have access to instruments and um, will come into all aspects of their learning as well. Um, but yes, music itself is a specific specialist subject and drama is not. And we do have shows yes. throughout the, the for the children. Are there any more questions? Well, if not, we'll sign off now and uh, keep in touch uh, through our website or email us uh, at DBIS. And thank you very much for your time again. And we look ho hopefully forward to meeting some of you in the future. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.